तस भगवतो अर्हतो समा संबुद्धसा नमो तस भगवतो अर्हतो समा संबुद्धसा नमो तस भगवतो अर्हतो समा संबुद्धसा The Buddha said uh, on more than one occasion that all he teaches is suffering and the end of suffering. So one uh, one thing this means is that the Buddha's teaching always has a, a practical purpose and an application. It's directed at human beings in their situation as they exist and uh, seeing the causes of suffering and w why beings suffer and how can we make an end of suffering. The word in, the, in Pali that's used for suffering in these uh, passages is dukkha, which actually has a somewhat broader meaning. It's a very important concept in, in the Buddhist teaching. It's the uh, first noble truth is the truth of dukkha, <coughs> and all four noble truths have some relationship to dukkha. There's the uh, truth of the origin of dukkha, the truth of the end of dukkha, and the tr truth leading of the path leading to the end of dukkha. So it's fairly important, it's actually critical to understanding the Buddhist teaching to really understand what is meant by dukkha. This can be approached in a, from a number of levels. I'll start by talking about it on what might be called the uh, philosophical or metaphysical level of, of dukkha. In this, uh, in the deepest aspect of dukkha, uh, it applies to all conditioned phenomena. Everything other than nibbana is dukkha. So every experience, every object, every phenomenon is is dukkha. And this right away um, points out one of the problems with translating it as suffering, because we know from ordinary experience that not everything in life is suffering. There is pleasure in life, there is happiness, there's also a lot of neutral experience, probably the majority of our mind moments for most people most of the time are, are neutral, just boring, neither happy nor sad, just neutral. But they're all dukkha, so dukkha really means something deeper than, than just suffering. It's also not um, at, this, at this level, this uh, philosophical level, it's not subjective. It's not an experience just because we suffer. It's, it's the objects themselves, phenomena in the, in the universe is dukkha. Dukkha really means something like imperfect or provisional, incomplete, um, uh, insufficient. One way of um, thinking about it is to compare phenomenal existence to uh, the void, to emptiness, the sunyata. Everything is ultimately sunya. Everything is without self-substance. But we can also talk about sunyata in, in the in the aggregate of the, the, um, the fundamental emptiness of, of all things. And uh, before anything manifests, the, 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 the purity of sunyata also means that besides being empty of phenomena, it also has an infinite potential. There's uh, anything could could happen because nothing has happened. The Tibetan um, uh, Buddhism, they, they, they like to use 
uh, uh, a lot of uh, imagery. And one of the um, ways that I've seen them talk about the sunyata or the void is to compare it to a womb. A womb is a uh, empty space. It's a cavity. It's a hollow. But it also has the, the potential of uh, generating life. So it's the um, the sunyata is like that. It's it's uh, the full emptiness. But once anything comes into manifestation, once we have an actual discrete object manifest in the world in uh, three dimensions in existence, then it no longer has an infinite potential. So it isn't. It is, in a sense, closed. It's like a broken piece or a shard. So everything is, in a sense, broken just by being in existence, by being manifest. Now that's not uh, not to be taken too negatively, because obviously in the world there are many beautiful things. We have the beauties of nature and uh, you know, we all enjoy you know, mountains and the sea, trees and animals and so on. But even these things are, are imperfect. You know, there, there's no perfection anywhere. There's another saying I come across in a Tibetan text is that there cannot be any single object in samsara that's perfect because if there were all consciousness would eventually find it and never move again and the universe would have ceased to exist long ago <clears throat> i know you can puzzle out the logic of that one but it's it's evocative in any case <clears throat> So that is the uh, the objective side of dukkha, is that things are imperfect, they're, they're, they're partial. In a sense, they're, con they're um, provisional, they're conditional. This is another important teaching of Buddhism, is that everything in samsara is conditioned, meaning that it arises due to causes and effect. And this is one of the aspects of emptiness is that nothing has its own self-substance. Nothing exists from its own side. Things only exist as a result of other things, like an intersection of, of vectors. And those themselves are also uh, imperfect, impermanent, and conditioned, conditional. So the, the idea of dukkha on this level is tied in with the ideas of emptiness and the ideas of conditionality, which are all very important for understanding reality. Now, keeping that as a background, the, um, the kind of metaphysical aspect of dukkha, if we take it down to the practical level, as, as the uh, Buddha was most interested in uh, talking about suffering and the end of suffering is at the human level, at, the, at suffering in, in individuals. You know, we experience dukkha uh, subjectively as well. And it occurs to some degree in every moment of existence. And it's associated with, uh, it has a different name with each of the three feelings. With actual pain, with suffering, um, uh, dukkha vedana, then we call dukkha, uh, dukkha dukkata, which is uh, like dukkha as such, or dukkha per se. You know, this is the straightforward, unproblematic, you know, this is getting poked in the eye with a sharp stick. This is no, no a debatable point about this kind of dukkha. Uh, with pleasure,
pleasure with happiness, uh, the type of dukkha is called dukkha viparinama, which means the dukkha of changeableness, because no pleasure, no experience is either complete or fully satisfying. It can be good, it can, we can experience pleasure, uh, pleasurable feeling, happiness, but it's never enough, it's never complete, it's never fully satisfying within samsara. And it's impermanent, it falls away. And then with neutral feeling, it's a, a dukkha sankata, dukkha as a characteristic. This is, uh, means that the other two forms don't apply, so all we have here is the metaphysical nature of dukkha as imperfection. So, obviously the real problematic aspect is dukkha dukkata, actual suffering. Here we can use the word suffering unproblematically. Uh, you know, human suffering, and it's defined in the First Noble Truth as uh, what is suffering, birth is suffering, Sickness is suffering, old age is suffering, death is suffering, separation from the beloved is suffering, attachment to the unloved is suffering, grief, lamentation, and despair are suffering. In short, these five aggregates, meaning the body and mind, are suffering. So he's addressing here the very real existential human suffering, which uh, we all experience uh, in the course of a human life, it's unavoidable. There's first of all birth, then there's uh, the inevitability of sickness, old age, and death. You know, old age may be avoidable if you get sick and die in your youth. But <laughs> but, uh, uh, death is, uh, is uh, uh, inescapable. And the suffering uh, we experience with these things has uh, uh, two aspects that are um, both suffering, but they're different. That is bodily and mental. In the Abhidhamma, the dukkha is classified as being either dukkha, uh, dukkha as such or a domanasa. Dukkha is, in the Abhidhamma, is used to refer to physical pain and domanasa for mental suffering. Now, physical pain is uh, a universal human experience, pain that comes from uh, illness or injury or uh, uh, just the, the, the natural pain in the body and uh, there's always a certain amount of pain in the human body it's unavoidable and this becomes more evident uh, as you age it becomes more evident that the human body is a, is a mass of suffering um, <clears throat> And the uh, <clears throat> aspect of suffering is, um, as a characteristic, is not immediately evident because of a uh, change of postures. Uh, each of the three characteristics, the three characteristics mean uh, dukkha, impermanence, and emptiness. And these are the three fundamental realities. And each of them is hidden from ordinary consciousness in some way. It, it takes some wisdom and penetration to see clearly, to see through the, the, the skies. Impermanence is hidden by the illusion of continuity, because uh, although things only exist for a moment, because of cause and effect, subsequent moments resemble each other in a series, so we tend to think of things as persistent. We perceive things as persistent. Emptiness is hidden by the illusion of compactness, in that we see 
we don't see empty, uh, we don't perceive ordinarily, you know, empty f phenomena, we perceive compact solid objects and we take that to be the fundamental reality. So both of those are kind of philosophical uh, and take a little bit of explanation, but Dukkha is very down to earth and you know, right in your right in your face in a sense and that uh, the, the way it's hidden is called change of postures and it's uh, literally and also figuratively taken literally it applies to pain in the body when people start meditating for the first time often they experience a lot of pain in the body uh, and it's not really that anything new it's just that it's the first time in their life that they've ever tried to force themselves to sit still while awake for a period of time and then the dukkha that's present in the body becomes evident uh, normally we kind of fidget to uh, on the on, and it works on the principle of a change as good as a rest you just you fidget you don't get rid of dukkha but you have a new constellation of dukkha and it seems easier for few moments. There is a uh, um, story about a, a Burmese a woman who was a meditation teacher and one of her techniques was when someone came to see her she'd uh, uh, have them sit in a comfy chair and she'd say okay are you comfortable? Well take your time make sure you're really comfortable so you can hear what I have to say. When you're just arrange yourself so you're absolutely comfortable and then when they say yeah I'm really comfortable this is a good chair and I'm well seated then she start talking and it would only take like five minutes and the person would inevitably like shift their weight to the other, other elbow or cross their leg the other way you know? and then she'd pounce on them she'd say what did you move for you told me you were comfortable <laughs> she used that as a uh, you know as a as an opening to talk about dukkha, dukkha in the body. And you can get enlightened through any of the three characteristics and one who gets enlightened through penetration of dukkha is said to be a body witness because dukkha is most evident in the body. There's no um, uh, there's no real, as long as you're in a human form, there's no real escaping from the dukkha in the body, that's, it's evident, it's present. Um, the Buddha himself, in his last uh, years of life, it, he had a lot of uh, physical pain in the body. He had a, a severe backache and he also had uh, digestive problems. You know, this is recorded that he was suffering a great deal physically but he didn't suffer mentally and he did have the um, the, uh, the means of a temporary respite from pain by going into jhana, by going into a deep meditation state. He, he said that, he told Ananda once, the only time I'm free of pain is when I'm in jhana. But here's the, you know, the, the critical thing is that although he experienced pain, he didn't experience any mental suffering. And this is the other aspect of suffering, the domanasa, which is in the um, uh, deepest sense, it's optional. You know, uh, physical pain is not optional. You're a human being, you're going to have physical pain from time to time or you know, various degrees of intensity. But uh, mental pain is something else altogether. And there's mental pain that can come associated with physical pain. And it adds a whole layer of suffering. If you have uh, uh, some physical pain and you, uh, that is a, a physical sensation. It's unpleasant physical sensation. But then if you add to that the mental kind of mental whinging, oh why me, oh this is so bad, I can't bear this, you know, it multiplies your suffering. 
and one kind of little simple simple way of um, dealing with it is uh, the way you think about it or the way you regard it in your mind. Like say if you've, uh, you've uh, hurt your foot, you've twisted your ankle and it's painful. You say, oh, my ankle's painful, it hurts so much. But if you say, instead of that, you say to yourself, there is pain. So you externalize it, you see it as an object. And it, then you don't add that layer of mental suffering because you're not identifying with it. You're not taking ownership of it. According to Abhidhamma, there's only of the we have the six senses. We have the um, the, the five physical senses, and we also have the mind sense, which um, takes as objects thoughts and emotions. And of the six senses, only two can directly experience pleasant and unpleasant feelings. And that's the uh, the body sense, that's the sense of touch, and the mind sense. Uh, with with uh, the other senses, it's indirect. We see a pleasant sight, we think we're experiencing pleasure through the eyes, but actually we're not, technically we're experiencing, because the eye consciousness just sees forms, but then the mind sense recognizes, oh, that's something beautiful, and it's a mind uh, sense that experiences pleasure. So this is why we have sayings like uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and we have things like acquired taste. You have a, some food that um, you didn't used to like but now you like it. And the food hasn't changed and actually your taste hasn't changed. You're still tasting the same thing but your mind sense is now processing it differently. So the mind is capable of pleasure and is capable of pain. And there's no value whatsoever in mental pain. This is another teaching from Abhidhamma that any state, any mind moment associated with mental pain has, or domanasa has an aspect of unskillfulness attached to it. Kusala. And you have to be a little bit uh, cautious how you take that because I, you know, some people hear that and they, uh, they then suffer more because they feel guilty for feeling, feeling bad. And it's not, you know, that's not a sensible approach. You just recognize, you know, there's no value in this. There's no value in feeling anxious or fearful or unhappy or Doesn't, it doesn't help in any way. It's an unskillful state of mind. If it's unpleasant, mentally it's, uh, it's unskillful. Now for uh, ordinary people, you know, those of us who have not, uh, not attained to, to the states of, of uh, Arahant or Buddha, that's almost everybody on the planet. Um, we don't have uh, absolute control of our mind. It's something we should be working towards, having a greater control of our mental states. It's, it's one of the characteristics of an arahant, that an arahant uh, thinks only what he wishes to think when he wants to think it. He is, he's the master of the pathways of the mind. We we all know from um, you know we when we when we meditate and we're trying to uh, at that time we're trying to control our mind. It, it doesn't uh, always want to be controlled. Uh, we have uh, you know thoughts intruding and memories and daydreams and you know, and um, this you know this is um, the unruly nature of the untrained mind. And suffering comes comes along with that. The 
so it's not something we have you know immediately access to, but it's something we should be striving towards is to tame the mind. It's the whole point of practice, taming the mind, gaining a, a handle on this this wild beast you know, that we call the mind, uh, domesticating it. The Buddha would use that those um, imagery. Well, he came from a Kshatriya family, a warrior caste, so. He used images that uh, would be familiar in that context of training, taming and training horses or elephants. He uses those to, as images for training the mind. There's a few kind of principles that, uh, that can be helpful to bear in mind. One is the uh, going back to the um, the teaching of anatta, not self, or, or emptiness of a self, is not taking ownership. You know, always to uh, uh, remind oneself, not this is not me, this is not mine. When you take ownership of some mental formation and identify it as me or mine, then you're caught. You're already caught. But if you see it, this is just a mental formation. And you see it as empty. And it becomes kind of um, almost ridiculous to imagine that something as ephemeral and unreal and empty as a thought could cause you any, any degree of distress. Why do you let that cause you suffering? even if they're thoughts that have a reference to problematic situations in the real world, in our life or in the greater world, they're still just thoughts, even if they're thoughts about something. And this is another uh, point related to this to bear in mind, is not to take your thoughts seriously, not to believe everything that, that's in your, in your mind passes through your mind. You, you don't have to follow a thought. You don't have to take ownership of it. You don't have to believe it. Our thoughts are, are only, if they're about the external world, they're only based on our images and perceptions, and those are themselves unreliable. Another, uh, another thing that um, can be very helpful is uh, uh, trying to remain as much as possible in the present moment. You know, in the present moment, there's just, just this as it is. And everything is, even the worst possible pain is bearable for a single moment. If you think about times you've been in pain, a large part of the, um, the misery of it is thinking, when will this end? But in a single moment, you could bear any amount of suffering or pain. It's just a single moment. When we, when we project our mind into the past or future, this is how we create a self. There's no self in the present moment. There's no reference for a self. If you think about it, when you identify a self, it's either one of two ways. Either you, you identify a self based on your history. Like if someone asks you who you are, you, know, you, you might tell them where you were born, where you went to school, you know, what, uh, what, you, what you've been doing lately. Um, your, your, your history that got you to this point. Or you project your, your mind into the future and you're thinking either in terms of fears and anxieties about what might happen or plans and speculations about what you want to do. So you have an, a reference of a self entangled in that. But in the present moment, there's just this. There's just this experience. Consciousness arising to an object. 
That's all there is in the present moment. There's no room for itself. So that mental suffering also really only happens when you project your mind out of the present moment. And I think it's it's helpful, as I said, not to uh, not to take your uh, your yourself or your thoughts, your emotions, so seriously. And it can uh, it can uh, actually help in a practical way to have a bit of a sense of humor about it. One of Ajahn Sumedho's uh, uh, lines, he talks about you know, inviting the defilements in for a cup of tea. You know, like anger is, you know, okay, okay, anger, go sit down, have a cup of tea, tell me what you're all about here. <laughs> uh, I, I recall um, my, my teacher, Kema Ananda, one time um, making a remark, he said that that uh, he thought the universe is actually a big joke. And there was somebody in the, in the room who objected to that and says, I don't think it's that, I don't think it's funny at all. And he said, well, that's just because you haven't got to the punchline yet. <laughs> so seeing, seeing the mental mental forms, whether they're thoughts or emotions or memories or, or uh, daydreams or um, anxieties or fears, to see them, see them as, as empty. They're conditionally arisen, they're empty, they're impersonal. And they, they don't have any substance, they don't have actually any power. Only we give them power when we identify with them. When we allow them to, you know, to take over, we identify with these mental formations. And you can counter negative mental formations with positive ones. You can counter anger with um, uh, loving kindness. You know, thoughts of anger come up and. Uh, Direct your mind instead to loving kindness, to compassion. You can get rid of uh, thoughts of desire by um, uh, turning the mind to the, the nature of the body, the 32 parts of the body. You know, to see the body not as a desirable object, but as uh, a, a, a sack of skin filled with all kinds of disgusting things, guts and bones and blood and pus. And So this is, the, the, these kind of practices are using mental formations in a, in a skillful way to counter, uh, counter uh, harmful mental formations. So the mental, the, the um, kind of getting to the end of the, the talk, I just want to sum it up, the, the main point to remember is that mental suffering is, in the last analysis, it's, it's optional. It's something we do to ourselves and we don't have to do it. You know, we can, it, uh, it's something we can learn to not do. more and more free of it, it won't, uh, it won't entirely cease, mental suffering won't entirely cease until one is fully, fully awakened, until one is an arahant, but it, be, it can become less and less. And certainly uh, beings in the world suffer a great deal just from their mental formations, uh, see it often. So, 